The Vernum cipher, also known as one-time pad, is a really interesting and important encryption method, encryption algorithm really. So before we actually look at how it works, let's take a step back and talk more generally about computational security. As I'm sure you can imagine, there are lots of different ciphers, lots of different encryption algorithms, and we can rate them based on their computational security. And this is assessed by the probability that the code can be deciphered in a set amount of time or with enough ciphertext. So essentially, computational security is like a mathematical measure of how strong the encryption algorithm is. So what are the chances given this amount of time or this amount of ciphertext we can break this encryption? And you know, the more time you have, the more computation you can do. And also with enough ciphertext, so if you had say 50 pages of ciphertext, you might be able to do frequency analysis on it to look for patterns. Often patterns are what give away a encryption. You can work backwards from patterns. But if you only have say a sentence of ciphertext, it's gonna be quite hard to analyze and find anything that's gonna be useful. So often it's either or if not both. So ideally, obviously you'd have both, lots of both. But computational security generally is how likely it is to be broken. And this is expressed in a, ma in a mathematical form. So a cipher that is said to be computationally secure means that the probability that it can be deciphered in a reasonable amount of time or with normal computing power is very low. So some ciphers might be able to be broken in 10,000 years if the computer is working non-stop or if there are loads of supercomputers. That's not normal, so we don't we can kind of discard that possibility because it's not ever going to happen. So we can describe that as being computationally secure. And this is where most everyday encryption algorithms fall into. So the Caesar cipher, which we've looked at so far, is definitely not computationally secure because it can be broken in constant time. All you have to do is try 25 combinations and it will be broken. So clearly that's nowhere near the standard we need for encryption methods. So of the cryptographic algorithms, the ciphers used that I've said are computationally secure, they can theoretically be solved. So as I say, they might be able to be solved in 10,000 years or with a million supercomputers or, you know, infinitely long ciphertext, but that's not ever going to happen, essentially. Um, there is some concern that maybe a quantum computer would be able to break quite common encryption, but we're not at that stage yet. So we can be computationally secure, uh, but still be broken eventually. And of course, you could get extremely lucky and you could guess the combination first try. That is possible, but the possibility is ridiculously low. And right at the bottom here, the Vernum cipher is interesting because it's the only, the literally only encryption method that has perfect security. So it's been mathematically proven to be unbreakable given whatever time you want, how many resources you want, and how long the ciphertext is. It's got perfect security. It cannot be broken unless you guess and get extremely lucky. So we'll come back to this idea a bit later on once we've looked at the actual cipher. So it's also known as, the Vernum cipher is also known as one-time pad, OTP. In fact, more commonly it's known as one-time pad, to be honest. And there is technically a slight difference between the two, but it's minor and it doesn't really matter for now. So we can use them synonymously if you want to. And it, it's called this because, first of all, it was written on a pad. This was sort of developed further during the second, uh, in the First World War, rather. So it was literally written on a pad of paper and then destroyed afterwards. And it's one time pad because the key used to do the encryption is used only once. So it's only ever used once with one message. So it's never used twice. If it is used twice, it's definitely not got perfect security anymore. But uh, it does have perfect security if certain conditions are met. One of which is the key needs to be truly random. It can't be, you can't just make up a key yourself. You've got to generate it randomly. True is in quotes because it's, it's very, very difficult if not in some cases impossible to get truly random numbers. But um, another condition that needs to be met is that the key must be of length equal to or greater than the plain text. So the key has got to be as long as or longer than the plain text itself. So the actual process to do this encryption is very simple. It can be expressed in three bullet points, which is nice. So first of all, you need to get your plain text and convert it to binary. You'll then generate the key, which has got to be totally random, and it'll be in binary, and it's got to be as long as the plain text. And then the ciphertext is actually produced just by applying bitwise, exclusive or on the plain text and the key. So each digit in each pair of digits uh, has the exclusive or operation applied on them. But let's look at this in an example, example with the plain text of hi with an exclamation mark. So first of all, we need to convert this to binary. I'm just going to use the standard ASCII 
representations. So this is the character code for H and I and the exclamation mark. You then need to generate a random key that's going to be the same length or longer than your plain text. In this case, it's one character longer. You want it to be a different length, really, because otherwise it gives sort of a clue that that's the length of your plain text. So you might be able to guess that it's a three letter word, for example. Um, so now we need to do the exclusive or operation on each of the pairs. So just a reminder that exclusive or the truth table for it looks like this. So if both if both digits are zero, it returns zero. If both are one, it returns zero as well. But the other two cases when they're different, it returns one. So here, one and zero is going to produce one. We've got the same here, so we're going to have different ones here. Uh, so we're doing it in pairs. It's bitwise, so it's it's bit, this one and zero, this zero and one, this zero and one, and so on. So it's up and down. And here, we're essentially we've got just zeros all the way out. So it's zero and one here, which is one. So when you have a key that's longer than your plain text, it just assumes it's going to be zeros for the plain text. So this string here is our ciphertext. And when we convert it back to ASCII, the first character is lowercase x. We then have two control characters, which you can't actually show, which is why you've got the weird little box. This is inquiry and this is sub, which I think stands for substitution. It's used when there's an error, but it doesn't really matter because you don't actually need to convert the ciphertext back because it doesn't always make sense. <laughs> you know, it's just using a random uh, value. Uh, it'll just be exchanged in binary. So we'll just send this in binary. You don't need to convert it back. Um, but you can see that we're sort of mixing up the plain text and the key. So we're sort of, not randomly because we're using exclusive or, but we're just shuffling up essentially. So we're mixing a non-random string with a random string and it produces a random string. To decrypt it, it's the exact same process. It's quite neat because the exclusive or operation is bidirectional, it works both ways. So you've got your ciphertext, you've got your key and you apply the exclusive or bitwise operation again and the value you produce is the plain text which is quite, the symmetry is quite nice. So you end up with one character longer, but this is in ASCII, this is the null control code. So you can just ignore this and you've got your plain text back again. Because the same key is used to encrypt and decrypt the data, this is said to be a symmetric encryption method as opposed to an asymmetric encryption method where two different keys are used, one to encrypt it and one to decrypt it. So the same key is used in the Vernum cipher and this key must be destroyed afterwards after it's used once. As soon as you use it and then decrypt it, you cannot use it again. That completely ruins the encryption. If someone uses the key twice to encrypt it, that could actually leave, that could ruin the security. That could make it very easy to decrypt. So that's often a reason why people mess up using the Vernum cipher is because they don't destroy it afterwards. Assuming it is destroyed and other conditions are met, it's worth reiterating that the Vernum cipher is the only cipher in the world that's ever been invented that can offer perfect security, which is amazing seeing how simple it is, uh, I suppose. The reason why this whole process works is because the plain text characters are not random, it's a just a, a sentence, but you're mixing it up with a random key and those characters are random. And that means because you're doing, you're combining them with the exclusive all operation, the resulting ciphertext is in fact random. So you are producing a random string from it, which is mathematically perfect. Despite me saying how fantastic it is, actually the Vernum cipher is not used very often in real life. And it's because of a few reasons, first of which is that it's very difficult to generate truly random numbers. Fake or pseudo random numbers are quite easy to generate, but they might produce a pattern which could give away your key and so undermine the whole encryption. Also, the condition that you've got to have the key as long as the plain text is quite challenging because in real life you're going to be trying to encrypt pages and pages of documents potentially not just a single sentence so it then becomes difficult to generate that many characters especially when you're trying to do it in a in a random way so that can be not very practical a third point is more an issue of symmetric encryption generally but also applies to the Vernum cipher this is the fact that because the same key is used to encrypt and decrypt it and likely two different people are going to be doing that process the key must be kept secret but also shared with the other person so if you can share it securely if you can go and meet them in a secure location you may as well just send the plain text or tell them the plain text at that point so Obviously, there are some cases where there might be a delay between the two like you are expecting a message in a week's time I want to do the share the key beforehand, but it does create an issue where you've got to 
So you've got to share the key securely, but that might be very difficult to do. And if the key isn't shared securely, then that is going to break the encryption because a third, par a third party could have intercepted the key and then can break your encryption very, very easily, which obviously does not mean that the Vernum cipher is perfectly secure in that case. It's only perfectly secure if the key is kept secret, but it's very difficult to keep a secret because you've got to exchange it at some point. And finally, the fact that the key cannot be reused even twice, it just cannot be reused even twice, that just gives away the encryption, it means that these three reasons are sort of made worse because you go through all this effort only to use it once. So it's got to be really worth your time. So it, it cannot be used, you cannot use the key more than once, but you've got to go through all of this again each time you want to encrypt something using the Vernum cipher. The main takeaway from this video, apart from the method of the Vernum cipher obviously, is the fact that we have all sorts of encryption methods, some are better than others, the Vernum cipher is the best in terms of security, but because it has so many conditions, actually it's not very usable. So for us, as both users and computer scientists, having just a computationally secure encryption method is good enough for almost all cases. The fact that it's very, very difficult to break is usually enough for us because it's not worth going through all of this hassle if it makes it just marginally more secure.